Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Civics, Civics. Civics 101. Yeah. Let's do a Mission Control style conversation. Okay. Uh, I don't know how that would sound. <laughs> T minus 30 seconds to episode go. Launch control team working no technical issues. Check. RTDC, TLS on 212. We're ready to go. Uh, Roger. All right. Very good. Well, I think we have a lot to learn here. <laughs> we don't know anything about NASA. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And I'm Nick Cafadice. And this is Civics 101. And today we're talking about NASA. NASA. Space. Can you tell me, Taylor, how is NASA a civics topic? Well, NASA is a is a big government agency. It's so strange. I feel like it's divorced from civics. Like, I feel like NASA is yeah. a separate thing. Right. And I think maybe that's because NASA isn't making decisions that have to do with our daily lives, right? Right. Or our, yeah, or our democracy, yeah. you know, or the way fun. But I guess maybe it, maybe it is. Two, one, booster ignition, and the final liftoff of Discovery. A tribute to the dedication of hard work and pride. So to understand all of this stuff, we got in touch with Amy Shira Title. She's a spaceflight historian, a YouTuber, and she posts videos about things like why haven't we gone back to the moon and why do people eat peanuts at launches? Uh, Her channel is called Vintage Space. Please check it out. And we talked to her via Skype. All right. I guess our first question is, uh, can you tell us what exactly NASA is? NASA stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and it is a civilian agency that what its name says is kind of the the main body, I guess, in the country about um, dealing with all the science and technology around space exploration. So why exactly was NASA founded to begin with? NASA was founded as a somewhat indirect response to the Soviet Union launching Sputnik on October 4th of 1957. Um, At the time, there were a number of different agencies and military groups in the United States that were starting to deal with things that would eventually become spaceflight. Um, The U.S. Air Force was starting to play around with human factors. The U.S. Army was developing rockets and missiles that could double as rockets for spaceflight. And then there was uh, the kind of predecessor organization to NASA called the uh, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics that was starting to kind of look... it, It was really the established kind of bureaucracy around all things aeronautics. So, like... If the Air Force needed a new plane, the NACA would have the wind tunnel to test it. So all these things were sort of working towards the same goal, but in disparate places. So it was ultimately Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, who realized in 1958 that if America was going to be able to respond in kind to this new Soviet technology in space, it would need to bring together all of the existing technologies under one umbrella. So that became NASA. Huh. Who does... Who does NASA answer to specifically? Well, the administrator is uh, appointed by the president. So at the end of the day, it is only the president, I think, can make a decree that NASA then has to act on it. The most obvious one is President Kennedy saying we're going to go to the moon and NASA saying, I guess we're going to the moon. (laughs) Um, But, you know, at the same time, because it is a civilian agency, right, Eisenhower established it as civilian, not military, because he really did not want space to become a battlefield for a hot incarnation of the Cold War. Um, so so it is, in a way, beholden to taxpayers as well, although, of course, you end up with senators from different uh, states looking to kind of help feed jobs in their areas. So you end up with NASA centers getting funded for different projects because it's the interest of voters in certain areas. But at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to the president. And does NASA have anybody like an attorney general? Do they have somebody, some secretary at the top who they have to answer to when the president isn't saying specifically, you know, time to go to Mars or the moon? I think that would be the administrator. The administrator is the highest position at NASA. Um, Anything the administrator decrees kind of trickles down to all the centers. But then all the NASA centers, the individual centers also have a director and then their own kind of leadership. Got it. Can I jump in for a second? And oh, yeah. Just of ask, course. Like, what are the centers like? Is there like Moon Center, Mars Center? I think. <laughs> uh, 
as fun as it would be if there was a moon center at NASA, um, no, the, the centers are, um, some of them actually predate NASA where old NACA sites that were then folded into NASA. Um, but they are the different sites that are all around the country for different kinds of research. So you have, um, like the Kennedy space center is a NASA site. Mm -hmm. It is where things are launched. And then you have the Johnson space center, which is another NASA site, which is where all the human missions are run from. So mission control is out there. Then you have JPL, the jet propulsion laboratory in Pasadena, California which is where all the unmanned missions come from. And it actually works in conjunction with Caltech, so it's a little bit messier there, but ultimately uh, robotic space flights there. And then you have centers like the Glenn Research Center and the Langley Research Center and the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is all Earth science stuff. So each one has a piece of the overall NASA puzzle, if that's sort of a clear way to think about it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm interested actually in sort of how NASA interacts with all these other agencies and, and our government. Because, um, you know, I, I really think it's fascinating that it's kept so separate from the military. But I can, can don't they kind of work together, though, sometimes? There, there is overlap. There's definitely overlap. Um, and actually, that's one of the, the reasons that Eisenhower was the one who also uh, declared that the first group of astronauts be chosen from military test pilots. One of the rationales for that decision was that they would have some military clearance already. And even though NASA was civilian, there would probably be some secret aspects in the early days of spaceflight, especially given that it was an incarnation of the Cold War that would maybe not be, would need to be kept from the public at least in the immediate future. So, yeah, and, the, you know, also not to mention the early rockets, like the Atlas that is still launching missions today, that came from a, a missile that was built with the U.S. Air Force. Um, and the Redstone that launched the Mercury missions came from the Army, as did the Saturn V. Like, that was an Army group that was brought into NASA. Honestly, I sadly can't answer the question of how all the centers interact, um, but I'm sure it's a lot of meetings. So if legislation goes through, the public usually has an opinion. This is a great idea. This is a terrible idea. I'm wondering if back in the 60s, was there any public opposition to funding something like NASA? Oh, yeah. Huge. <laughs> People have this idea that NASA was like the golden child of the 60s and that yeah. Apollo was like the happy union of everything. Like yeah. Apollo had a 50 percent approval rating when Apollo 11 launched. People don't remember is that this is right when civil rights was getting like dominating the national conversation, also women's liberation, also the Vietnam War. I mean, the government wasn't doing anything that anybody liked by the late 1960s. And there's always this talk that um, Apollo 8, which was the first mission to the moon, it just orbited, didn't land, um, that it was sort of like it saved 1968 in a way because everything was kind of the worst. And then these three guys went to the moon and they took a picture of our planet that shows no borders and no war. It's just this beautiful oasis floating in space and suddenly like, okay, this is bigger than all of us. Um, but it's, you know, it was not something that people necessarily cared about. I mean, NASA was living in this bubble of crew cuts and skinny black ties and white dress shirts and People were being killed in the streets in protest. I mean, it wasn't exactly a great time. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of Gil Scott Heron's uh, song, Whitey's on the Moon. Mm-hmm. That, that sums it up really well. So I think my, my follow-up question to that is, it's a big one, um, which is why? Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Why? Why space? Why space? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know it's 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 one of those ones that's like weirdly hard to justify, I think. Um, I mean, why space in the first place? Like it, because it's there. Um, people have always kind of been fascinated with space. And I'm and I'm saying like way back when in like the 1800s and 1900s, it's sort of been kind of feeding that curiosity that the more we learn, the more we realize that we don't know. And I think a lot of this stuff ultimately comes back to us wanting to understand our own place in space. So all of that sounds just so kind of lovely and pure yeah, and right? above it all and Star trek -y. But of course, in order to do that, we need to get politicians to agree to fund this, to make yeah. all of this happen. How does NASA factor into politics? I think everyone, especially people who love space, specifically people who love space, would love to pretend that space is free of politics. But space is nothing but politics. Um, I had a, a little an eight year old girl ask me at a talk in uh, Australia a couple years ago why they went to the moon. And I just thought, oh, God, 
How do you explain international pissing contest to an eight-year-old in a country that doesn't learn about the Cold War? It's all politics. It always comes down to politics. It's really hard, I think, for people to look at something like putting a rover on Mars and understanding why their lives immediately benefit. It's hard, I think, for politicians to then sell their constituents on why they should vote for space things. So it, it's so wrapped up in politics, but it also means that it's so stuck by politics. Mm. And the other thing, the other thing that, that kind of becomes a bit of a mess with NASA and being kind of governed at the very, very top by the president and by an administrator appointed by the president is that every administration has something different that it wants to do, but space doesn't happen in neat little four-year packets. So how has the budget for NASA shifted over the years? Because things like getting to the moon did happen, but obviously, well, at least I would guess that the budget's a little bit different smaller? now. <laughs> yeah. Significantly smaller. Yeah, NASA's budget has changed over the years in that it's much, much smaller. Um, so at its peak in about 1966, NASA was getting a little over 4% of the federal budget. So 4% of all of your tax dollars were going to the space agency. Uh, the money NASA got started to dwindle towards the end of the decade. And it's kind of gone in, in ups and downs. It's never reached that high spending again. Currently, it's about somewhere around one cent on the dollar. So for every tax dollar, one penny goes to NASA. I mean, I can't math, but that is a tiny <laughs> fraction of what it got in its heyday. Yeah. The problem is that you have you have leaders could, that come in and say they want to see some big thing happen, but they don't want to increase NASA's budget. But you can't do something big like go to Mars with a couple cents on the dollar. You need to kind of give that funding. But you did. You said to us that it feels like that uh, NASA is stuck. Do you have any idea of how to get unstuck? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think what it what it ultimately takes is someone with vision beyond his or her term as president or administrator, because what we ultimately need, I mean, we can't go to Mars in five years. We can't get to Mars over somebody's term as president. If someone had the vision to do something that was like for the benefit of humanity, that somebody couldn't come along and easily cancel. I mean, but it's hard to have that kind of vision. Or, or maybe if this is the cynical viewpoint, Amy, is that maybe you need mm -hmm. another Cold War. Or, yeah, I mean, that's the that's the one that I don't like to talk about. But like it could be that, you know, if you know, if, if China says we're going to put people on the moon and do this, America might suddenly be like, all right, here, NASA, take five percent of the federal budget again and just do it. Make it happen now. What's what's NASA up to today? What kind of stuff are they doing? Yeah, people have this idea that. NASA ceased to exist when it canceled the shuttle program. That's not the case at all. <laughs> um, the most visible thing that NASA is doing that we see is the International Space Station. Um, there's still people up there all the time. There's also a lot of uh, Earth science going on, missions that are currently mapping things like water level and rising sea level, which is super important for us to understand what's actually happening with climate change. Um, and then out of JPL, we still have all the deep space robotic missions. Um, the Voyagers that were launched in the 1970s are still sending back data. Um, we've got the Curiosity rover on Mars is a NASA mission. And that's the stuff that's kind of visible. There's always stuff happening that people don't know about. Is there anything else you wish we knew about NASA before we let you go, Amy? Um, the one thing I try to get everybody to really think about when it comes to NASA is how much the technology that comes out of NASA ends up back on Earth with us. Because I think if people understood how much NASA really does for us, like medically and everything every day, you might change your tune about NASA being a giant waste of money to put fancy smart people in space um you know i mentioned lasik coming from line of sight orbital, orbital rendezvous but there's like new mammogram technology that's able to detect much smaller cancers came out of nasa technology wow. the technology that keeps your drink hot or cold in a thermos came from nasa um and people don't think about the connection to nasa but i think if they did you might kind of have a better appreciation for just just how important the space agency actually is in this country that was Amy Shearer Title. She runs the YouTube channel Vintage Space, and she wrote a book about the origins of NASA titled Breaking the Chains of Gravity. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. So 
Taylor, we recorded this episode a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. and Hannah's not here today. She's out sick. But one of the main things that stuck with me is how political space is. This place that I thought politics did not exist suddenly is everything. Space is nothing but (laughs) politics. And uh, there's something you were talking with me recently, which is there's a, is it a new head of NASA? Yeah, the the NASA administrator. Administrator, okay. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, I think a lot of the stuff that Amy talked about, about the intersection of politics uh, and NASA and space um, sort of come together with this confirmation. Jim Bridenstine is a Republican member of Congress from Oklahoma. He's a former Navy pilot. um, And he's actually the first head of NASA who is a congressman. Um, Previous uh, administrators have been basically science professionals, so people who either came up the ranks through NASA or people who are scientists, that sort of thing. So uh, this was pretty much the most hotly contested and controversial confirmation of a a NASA head in history. I have no... What's it going to be like with somebody who hasn't come up through the ranks being at the head of this very scientific organization? Well, well, I think some people, that is the concern, is that they just don't quite know what it means. Um, But but there's actually something pretty telling that might give us a hint uh, of of what Jim Bridenstine is going to be thinking about Mm -hmm. as the administrator. And that's because in April 2016, he put forth uh, some legislation called the American Space Renaissance Act, which he openly admits is less uh, a piece of legitimate legislation that he hoped to pass. So much as, I mean, it sounds like a a resume for what he thinks NASA policy should be. And there's a real emphasis on exploration and and an emphasis with that exploration on security and some de-emphasis on research, especially sort of earth sciences research, Mm -hmm. which is a cause for concern for a lot of folks because he has hedged on climate science. One thing that Amy brought up that I had never considered is if you shift... Uh, if you shift gears from, say, uh, Mars to the moon, you kind of got to start from scratch because you've been working on all this stuff for so long. To change the mission is a huge thing. Well, well, and this I think there's some interesting room for debate here because one of the things that Jim Bridenstine has talked about uh, and that he's proposed is making the NASA administrator have a five-year term to create some sense of continuity. To sort of help influence the next incoming president. Right, and uh, potentially to fund NASA um, under a sort of larger multi-year um, project-based stuff. So I think that would that would also maybe ease some of the problems that, that Amy talked about of why NASA sometimes gets stuck. This episode was produced by Taylor Quimby. Our executive producer is Erica Janik, and our team includes Jimmy Gutierrez, Justine Paradise, and Ben Henry. Music today is by Ari De Niro and Uncanny Valleys. Summer's coming up. All you AP U.S. history or civics teachers out there, if you want to be on our show, we would love to have you. We're looking for a variety of guests to be on the show to break down basic civics tenets to Hannah and myself from across the country. Uh, Give us a call, 202-798-6865. Leave a message saying what topic you'd like to do and why you think you're the one to do it, and chances are we'll get back to you. So that's about it. Civics 101 is a production of NHPR, New Hampshire Public Radio. Sir. (laughs) That's good. Captain. Sir. That's my wharf. He's just so angry. (laughs) Sir. (laughs) Look, when I do impressions, I have only one thing they can do. 